Legend of Exorcism Volume 3, Akalanatha Chapter 123 Looming Disaster Looking back from Chang'an, Mount Li piles like rolls of brocade, and the thousand gates of walking palace open one by one. A rider sends up clouds of red dust as he sets forth, spurred by the consort's smile, yet no one knows. Oh! What's this? Hung Jun's attention was already drawn in by the white fruit placed in the crystal bowl on the table. Those fruits were sparklingly translucent, interspersed with chunks of ice, and in this intense summer heat, they gave off wave after wave of coolness. A small plate of salted water for dipping was even placed to the side of it. Li Jinglong replied very quietly, Lichis. He then gestured for him to settle down and start eating. In the Jin Huolo, Yuan Kun put away the fortune-telling shells placed on the table. The hall was filled with a solemn and grave atmosphere as Li Longji said, This great master has come per request of Gaolishi, for the sake of casting a national fortune for my great Tang. Li Jinglong glanced at Yuan Kun, wondering how he had mixed himself up with Gaolishi, but as his thoughts turned, his mind drifted to how, in this past year, too many things had happened. Though Li Longji was old, he was not dumb and he had probably also sensed that under this splendid veneer, the roots of the Great Tang were already beset by some almost imperceptible danger. In the blink of an eye, Xia Yu escaping out of Chang'an, Yuan Kun entering the city, banners flying only for Gaolishi to spot him and thus bringing him in front of the emperor flashed through Li Jinglong's mind. With the Kun God's knowledge of the divine mysteries, he was able to view the possibilities of the future, so this discussion was not only a discussion between a Yao King and a human emperor, it also indicated to him that the matter was perhaps not yet concluded. What tribulations will the Great Tang suffer in the future? Li Longji asked. A wild, torrential storm, and bolts of lightning and thunder. As he finished speaking, the Kun God darkened the entirety of the Jin Huolo with a simple wave of his sleeve. Everyone immediately looked around themselves as thunder rumbled repeatedly from some unknown source. A cold wind began to blow, and suddenly, Yuan Kun was speaking into Hung Jun's ear thanks to a communication spell. Tomorrow, when the dawn breaks, come to the Xin Jiao Temple to find me. Don't look back, eat your lychees. The sky darkened and the Jin Huolo grew pitch black. Countless silhouettes of Yao seemed to be dancing across that huge screen, accompanied by the sound of men shouting and horses neighing. Black clouds rolled forth, as if a grand battle was suddenly unfolding across the screen. Fresh, crimson blood seeped forth and the sea of blood instantly engulfed the entirety of the Jin Huolo. The members of the exorcism department, however, continued to watch the screen unblinkingly. Li Hung was the first to lose his composure, and he almost shouted out loud, but Li Longji continued to watch the screen intently, one hand pressing down on his son's knee. Not long after, all of it vanished, and the Jin Huolo returned to how it had been before. A hush fell over them all. After a long time, a voice finally broke the silence. Are there any more lychees? Hung Jun had already eaten the entire bowl of lychees. Everyone. The corners of Li Longji's mouth twitched. Li Hung said, I'll have someone bring some to you in a bit. But? Li Longji asked gravely, when will the disaster begin? He looked towards where Yuan Kun had been standing before, but Yuan Kun had suddenly disappeared without a trace. Li Longji fell silent, before letting out a sigh. He has left, Li Jinglong said. Li Longji was a little shaken. Hung Jun, on the other hand, was thinking about how these lychees were really too yummy, and he almost wanted to tap against the bowl as he waited for more lychees. He stared pitifully at Li Hung, but their great tang was about to collapse, so how could he have the effort to spare for your lychees? The reason Zhen summoned you all here today was also to determine whether this fangxi's words are true or false. Li Longji barely managed to calm himself. He originally wanted to ask about the Great Tang's fortune, but he had never expected that that would result in this. Li Jinglong said, I recognize him. 
the predictions that he has made before have not yet been verified. No, it'd be better to say, only one has been confirmed. And what would that be? Li Hung asked. It has to do with me, Li Jinglong replied. It is a relatively complicated matter, and will be difficult to explain in detail quickly. Hung Jun startled and looked up at Li Jinglong as many thoughts went through his mind. The Kun God's prediction did indeed seem to never have been proven ever since the first time he had appeared in front of everyone. But I trust that looking ahead in preparation for a rainy day is also a good thing, Li Jinglong continued easily. Great Master Kun's words are actually intimately related to the various strange things that have happened this time. Originally, Li Jinglong was having a massive headache over how to persuade Li Longji in accepting all of these fantastical things, Yang Kuaz Hong was a Yeo Gui and An Lushan was a devil who wanted to overthrow the Great Tang, no matter what, no one would believe those words. But the Kun God, whether purposefully or not, had set the stage for him beforehand, which made things much easier. So with that, Li Jinglong had organized his thoughts and began his tale from 200 years ago with the Yao King Xiaoyu and the Phoenix. He then spoke of how Xiaoyu took over Chang'an and what the nine-tailed heavenly fox did. Li Hung was still in a state of shock, but Li Longji had long since heard Li Jinglong speak vaguely of it before. After that came the case in the northwest where they had subdued the Yaos and the demons, then the case of the haunted royal mausoleums. Finally, when An Lushan was mentioned, Li Longji could remain silent no longer. An Lushan. Li Longji was stunned. Li Jinglong nodded slowly, before adding, as of now, he has already escaped back to Fanyang. And who is Xie Yu? Li Longji asked. We have already sent Xie Yu running, Li Jinglong replied matter-of-factly. Since this involved the chancellor of a country, Li Jinglong didn't dare to just suddenly reveal the truth. If he had, that would definitely stir up a powerful tremor, but even with that single subtle gesture, Li Longji instantly understood. In the end, Li Jinglong detailed what had happened on the day of the birthday celebrations, thus winding up the case, before saying, that's where things stand today. The entirety of the Jin Huoluo once again sank into a deathly still silence. Zhen still remembers, Li Longji murmured, the moment where Zhen first saw Xia Yu, 20 years ago. This time, it was the group's turn to be stunned. Li Longji had actually seen Xia Yu's true form before. What did it say? As soon as Li Jinglong asked that question, however, he felt that it was inappropriate. In the end, Li Longji was the emperor, and no matter what, a subject had no right to be so forward. Li Longji, however, didn't seem like he was going to blame him, and instead replied, that was when Zhen was at the Wei River performing a sacrificial ritual. The river was covered in a fog so thick that you couldn't see your own outstretched hand, and as Zhen was briefly lost in thought, Zhen caught a glimpse of it. It said to Zhen. Keep your lands for now and once you, once you. Li Longji hesitated for a long time, but everyone present at the scene could fill in the second half of that sentence for him, once you die, I will come to claim them. Li Hong's expression instantly grew very nasty. All of the gathered officials, military and literary, saw the black Jiao's back disappear into the water, and in less than half a Shishan, that dense fog dispersed as well, Li Longji's wizened voice said. They dubbed Xiaoyu as an auspicious tiding, but only Zhen knew that this was actually an inauspicious omen. In Zhen's life, Xiaoyu has only appeared once, yet has caused Zhen no end of unease. The reason the exorcism department was formed was also because of this. And once he said that, Li Longji looked towards Li Jinglong. It was only then that Li Jinglong understood why, since the exorcism department had been reinstated, Li Longji had been treating them especially leniently. Zhen is tired, Li Longji said to Li Hung. Work with Li Jinglong to come up with a plan on how to capture Kuaz Hong and Lushan and bring them back to Chang'an. Zhen wishes to ask them some questions. Hidden in his words was the fact that Li Longji had long since understood as clearly as his own reflection, Yang Kuaz Hong was Xiaoyu, there was no doubt about that. 
Li Jinglong thought, you said that, not me. If Imperial Consort Yang asks, I won't be taking the blame. In reality, Li Longji was no fool. For such a large thing to happen, for the Chancellor of a nation to disappear just like that, how could he have no clue as to the truth? As he rose, everyone sensed that compared to when they had seen him the year before in the walking pool, Li Longji had grown even older, and the Emperor's steps even seemed to be a bit unsteady. After Li Longji left, Li Hong personally saw the group off at the Meridian Gate. Night was falling, the cicadas' cries had quieted, and Chang'an had grown quite a bit cooler. Li Hong had passed beyond his initial state of shock, and had finally realized that the current situation was starting to tilt in his favor. The days where he could stand tall and proud were finally about to begin. For Li Hong's two greatest rivals in his life, and Lushan and Yang Kuaz Hong, to be both actually Yeo Guai also meant that Li Jinglong would carry out his duties in getting rid of them. He himself no longer had to worry, all he had to do was to wait to inherit the throne of the Great Tang. Don't act just yet, heed my orders, Li Hong said. And Lushan has escaped to Fanyang, and he will definitely not stretch his neck out for the executioner's blade. There are many internal affairs there that you must wait for me to resolve first. Otherwise, I'm afraid of spurring his army into a revolt. Li Jinglong knew that in Lushan, as the Jadushi of Pinglu and Fanyang, had a hundred thousand valiant warriors under his command. If the situation was not dealt with carefully, and he was simply beheaded, that would likely incite a revolt. Perhaps, what Yuan Kun was predicting was the internal unrest within the Great Tang that would erupt after An Lushan died. Li Jinglong slowed and said earnestly to Li Hung, Your Highness, you must not let your guard down. The devil must be dealt with as soon as possible. Li Hung's intentions had been seen through by Li Jinglong and he felt a little awkward. He replied, Of course I understand that. Li Jinglong reported to Li Hung that his group was heading to Hangzhou. Without even thinking about it, Li Hung agreed. Suddenly, he noticed Chiu Yangxi hanging back behind the rest of the exorcism department, and he studied him for a second, but he didn't ask any more, instead sending Li Jinglong back. After Li Jinglong left the palace, he looked up at the star-filled night sky and did a full-body stretch. His arrest warrant had been dealt with. He had also regained his freedom. The troubles this time had finally come to an end. When he turned back around, however, he saw that everyone else's expressions were odd, as if they were still considering the Kun God's prediction. Why does everyone look so dejected? Li Jinglong chuckled. Be a little happier, aren't the salaries being distributed tomorrow? Everyone nodded at that and mustered up a smile or two. Li Jinglong continued seriously, to tell you the truth, the Kun God's prediction may not be accurate. True, Chiu Yangxi said. The future is in our hands. Even if there is fighting, I think it will be localized, Ashina Kayang said. It shouldn't spread across the entirety of the central plains. Atai shook his head. That's impossible. In this moment, everyone was basically on the same page. They would rather choose to believe that this was true and that there was nothing that was untrustworthy. It was very likely that a battle would break out, and that was unavoidable. The only thing in doubt was the scale of it. Li Jinglong continued, mortals have their own battlefields. Our only enemy is in Lushan. As for the rest, that should be for the crown prince to deal with. Tomorrow, let's set out bright and early tomorrow morning. Everyone agreed to that, but Hung Jun hadn't been expecting that they would be leaving so soon. That night, the members of the exorcism department returned to their base to pack their things, only to find that the reward had arrived in the alleyway that night as well, this time, Li Jinglong's title had not been elevated, but rather, a large amount of reward money had been sent, as well as already tailored summer clothes. Li Jinglong hurriedly knelt to receive the edict, but beside the eunuch who was announcing the edict stood Imperial Consort Yang. I heard that Hung Jun likes leeches, Imperial Consort Yang said, so I had them sent over to you. 
Li Jinglong knew that Imperial Consort Yang would definitely have paid them such a visit. His original line of thought was that if they set out early tomorrow, he would be able to avoid this confrontation that he didn't know how to deal with. He hadn't expected that she would actually not be able to wait for even a single moment. Imperial Consort, this way please. Li Jinglong had no choice but to make a welcoming gesture. The eunuch with the message left the exorcism department to wait outside. Everyone immediately grew curious, all of them gathering around to eavesdrop. This was also the first time that Lu Su was seeing Imperial Consort Yang. He asked Hung Jun, is that the consort? She's so pretty. No lamps had been lit in the exorcism department. The only source of light was the light of the moon, which made Imperial Consort Yang's beauty even more refined and moving. Hung Jun said, she's a very, very good person, it's just, I. It wouldn't be really accurate to say that her luck was not good, because Li Longji had never appointed an empress and had kept Yang Yahuan as the mother of the country. But her older sister and her older brother were both Yao, so it was hard to say exactly what she had done to bring such misfortune down on her own head. Go pack your things, Mo Rajin said. We'll be setting out early tomorrow. Go, go, stop eavesdropping. Lu Su glared at Mo Rajin. After Hung Jun recovered, he hadn't really been able to talk to Mo Rajin, so he immediately turned around and climbed onto Mo Rajin's back, saying, Chia. He shooed Mo Rajin along and Mo Rajin, his steps swift and wide, carried Hung Jun away. That night, Hung Jun didn't have much to pack. When he thought about how it had been the Karpia to pack his things every time he had gone on a trip, another wave of sadness came over him. Mo Rajin was still sitting outside the door, so Hung Jun chatted a bit with him. Mo Rajin turned back to glance at him as he replied from time to time. Within the exorcism department, for who knows what reason, Mo Rajin and Hung Jun had always been a little closer. Perhaps it was because Mo Rajin, as the Grey Wolf, was also a half Yao, and before they had met Lu Su, he and Hung Jun had often felt close because they were of the same kind. But when Hung Jun asked after Lu Su, Mo Rajin seemed a little unwilling, as if he didn't want to reply. Do you like him or not? Hung Jun asked, sitting down with his bundle. Of course, I like him, Mo Rajin replied. I now understand how that feels. Then why aren't you telling him? Hung Jun said, pushing him. Go now, go. You've kissed already, and you've even done that. At that, Mo Rajin began to chuckle, a little lost in his thoughts. I just can't swallow down this pride, Mo Rajin said. Hung Jun. Never you mind, Mo Rajin said. He then reached out to stroke Hung Jun's head, before telling him to go back inside and sleep, while he himself rose and left. I have my ways of handling him. Hung Jun's mouth twitched, and he wondered if that was necessary. He himself waited inside the room for Li Jinglong, but Li Jinglong never came. Imperial Consort Yang seemed to still be there. When the second gang was about to arrive, Hung Jun suddenly remembered his appointment with the Kun God, so he came outside, preparing to go see the Kun God. The moon had risen high into the sky and the doors to the main hall were still shut. The people in the yard, however, had yet to go to sleep. Mo Rajin was currently talking with Lu Su in the yard. He had one hand pressed to the trunk of the parasol tree in the middle of the courtyard, while Lu Su's expression was reserved, as if he was mocking him. When the two of them saw Hung Jun coming over, they both turned to glance at him. Hung Jun immediately waved his hand, indicating that they should continue. Lu Su, however, asked, where are you going? Hung Jun said, the Sim Jiao Temple. Mo Rajin said, I'll send you there. Lu Su. Lu Su studied Mo Rajin. Hung Jun didn't know what these two were doing, running into the yard to talk instead of hugging each other and being nice and intimate in their rooms during the middle of the night. Lu Su said, I'll go with you. Mo Rajin replied, then let's go together. Hung Jun. 
Hung Jun had quite a lot that he wanted to ask the Kun God, so he nodded and let the two of them follow along. The grey wolf and white deer transformed at the same time, both of them waiting for him to climb on top. Hung Jun looked at them for a while, before finally choosing the white deer and climbing on top. The grey wolf shook its fur a few times, lifting its leg to scratch behind its ear, before it also went racing out of the exorcism department. They hadn't traveled far when they suddenly saw Xu Yangtze, Atai, and Ashinakayan coming back with a bunch of bundles in all shapes and sizes. Where are you going? Xu Yangtze asked curiously. Hung Jun. With that, their group increased by three people. Xu Yangtze had to make a trip home, and he wanted to bring a few local specialties to Hangzhou while he was at it, but it would evidently be too late once he waited for the western market to open up during the day, so he went with Atai and Ashinakayan to the merchant's guild. They had just so happened to run into the three of them. Do you know why the big wolf said that he wanted to see you off? The white deer carried Hung Jun as it flew over the city of Chang'an, while the grey wolf raced along the streets with the rest of them on its back. Hung Jun asked curiously, why is that? Lu Su replied, because he knows I wanted to take that chance to escape and leave with you. Hung Jun was torn between laughing and crying. You both like each other, so what's the point of giving each other the cold shoulder? Lu Su said, I just can't get over that anger. Hung Jun had also asked Li Jinglong, whose answer had been to let them figure it out themselves and to not say too much to them. With that, Hung Jun wisely remained silent, not voicing his own view on Lu Su and Mo Rijin's recalcitrant love. End chapter Legend of Exorcism Chapter 124 The Shining Brilliance of Baoxiang Behind the Sing Jiao Temple, the lone moon shone over the grove. It was deep into the night and everything was still. There was not even a hint of movement. All of the rooms in the temple were dark. The moonlight shone into the main hall of the Sing Jiao Temple. Hung Jun was still looking around, only to hear a ding come from the back of the hall, that was the sound of a wooden mallet striking a Qing. A breeze began to blow. Hung Jun swiftly walked through the main hall, coming to a halt in front of the nine-story pagoda in the back of the hall. A person stood there at its foot. Where is Li Jinglong? Yuan Kun asked. Hung Jun replied. Jing Long is currently talking with the Imperial Consort. Yuan Kun said, Ah well. Even if he had come, I imagine he would not have wanted to hear this. See, that is why the saying goes, changes exist amidst the unseen currents of the world. Hung Jun walked closer to the Kun God, saying, That day, Kun God, you left in a hurry. There are many things that I haven't had a chance to ask clearly yet. Truthfully, Hung Jun did harbor a bit of discontent towards the Kun God. He had taught Li Jinglong the art of setting alight one's essence and if Hung Jun hadn't done that, Li Jinglong could very well be dead right now. Have all your friends come out, Yuan Kun said mildly. This too, counts as a kind of fate. Hung Jun had no choice. All of you, come out. The group emerged from all directions. Yuan Kun said, with this battle formation, are you thinking of subduing me? Hung Jun hurried to explain that they were not, but from hearing those footsteps in each direction, Yuan Kun had deduced that this was an obvious encirclement. You have never understood the schemes of humans, Yuan Kun said. Though that is good in its own way. You have the heart of a child, but how sincerely has this world treated you in return? Lu Su said, we do not mean to defeat you, Yeogwai. Don't try to stir up enmity between us. Hung Jun hurried to gesture for Lu Su not to get angry. The Yao kings were always both good and evil. The Kun God, the Golden Winged Great Pen, the Phoenix Chong Ming. All of them seemed to hold a thinly veiled criticism of his human friends, they did not wish to become friends with the exorcism department, nor did they harbor much hostility. This left Hung Jun in a little bit of an awkward situation. Chiu Yangtze smiled. The Kun God is a senior who has followed Saint Zhuang in the past. 
this humble one does not dare to even think about offending him. The reason we have come under the cover of the night was because we were afraid of being too forward and offending you, so instead we wished to avoid you. If you were truly afraid of offending me, you would not have come along at all, you and Kun said coldly. Oh well. This is also your karma. And saying this, he turned to Hung Jun. Hung Jun vaguely sensed that his companions had always been very smart, so perhaps they had long since been waiting for a chance to see the Kun God. Kun God, Hung Jun said, I wish to ask something of you. Yu and Kun did not respond to that. Instead, he asked gravely, that hairy-legged carp that was following you around. Yes, yes. That was exactly Hung Jun's question. I only just learned that Zhao Zilong was actually, I. Yu and Kun said, this matter is a meeting of karma, and was long since destined to be. Hung Jun, will it come back? Yu and Kun, are you the Kun God, or am I? How about you come and make this declaration instead? I won't talk. Hung Jun hurriedly snapped his mouth shut. Yu and Kun continued, the reason I had you come to the Sien Jiao Temple is because this place is inextricably tied to one person here. And saying this, Yu and Kun raised his hand easily and tapped it gently against that pagoda. The entire pagoda began to glow with a golden light, and the faint outline of someone with a monk's robe draped over him appeared at the foot of the tower. Everyone's expressions immediately changed. Hung Jun asked, Who are you? Everyone almost face planted. You are Mahamayuri. That shadow took on the form of a monk, he was actually a young, handsome Buddhist monk, light and shadow intertwining to form his solemn visage. That level of handsomeness had actually managed to beat out that of this group of youths from the exorcism department, and what was even more rare was that this young monk's exquisite handsomeness completely differed from Hung Jun's. It carried with it the solemnity and sanctity of becoming a Buddha. I, Hung Jun was also unsure how he should reply. I guess I am. At that, that monk nodded and walked forward, saying to Hung Jun, this monk's priestly name is Xian Zhang. Hello. Hung Jun remembered that the Karpiao had once mentioned that 70 years ago, in Chang'an, a monk had once saved him. That was probably this monk called Xian Zhang. He's Zhao Zilong's benefactor. You all, what's wrong? When Hung Jun looked back, he was quite shocked. Everyone had knelt of their own accord, and none of them dared to look up. Even the Kun God had retreated to the outskirts, sitting on the ground, his hands pressed together. Though the members of the exorcism department had come from impressive backgrounds, and usually, they went around with their noses turned up, not even greeting emperors or immortals when they saw them, but the monk that had appeared in front of them was a Buddha. Only Hung Jun, who didn't know of Su and Zhang's origins, still stood there naively. He guessed internally that this monk seemed to be pretty powerful. I will not speak of the scriptures today, Xian Zhang said. Everyone, please rise. And saying this, Xian Zhang sat down. Hung Jun also took a seat next to him, crossing his legs. That Karpiao, in its past life, was supposed to have a somewhat important background, Xian Zhang detailed to Hung Jun. But because it provoked the wrath of the world, it owed you quite a number of debts, and it has come in this life to repay you for your kindness. This counts as revenge instead, doesn't it? Hung Jun said, a rare outburst of words pouring out of him. You call this repaying me for my kindness. It has not yet repaid you, Xian Zhang said. This has been fated to happen in its life, as well as in yours. Hung Jun thought for a bit, before saying, actually, I've forgiven it as well. After he had woken, Li Jinglong had said that everyone in the exorcism department had long since been able to tell that Zhao Zilong was questionable. Its identity as the spy was also something that they had used to spread fake news, and the reason they hadn't told Hung Jun before was because they were afraid Hung Jun wouldn't be able to hide it. Hung Jun had no choice but to accept it. This was something that everyone had decided on together, not something that Li Jinglong was doing his best to hide from him. 
Plus, this plan was also devised at its heart to protect Hung Jun, so he didn't say anything more on the matter. Where is it now? Hung Jun asked. I'm worried that Xia Yu will bully it. Xian Zhang continued, the fate that ties you two together is not yet ended. After it finishes with its tribulations, it will return. With that, Hung Jun nodded. These words did truly make him feel much more at ease. Once Xian Zhang finished speaking, he prepared to turn into golden light and vanish, only for Yuan Kun, who was sitting cross-legged, said darkly, Jin Shanzi, I still have one thing to seek your advice on. Xian Zhang did not speak. Yuan Kun continued, what exactly will bring about the chaos of the central lands? Xian Zhang replied slowly, there are 10,000 ways of the world, but in the end, evil will not win out against good. The incarnation of Varokana, the revolving will, can defeat all matters of devils. And saying this, Xian Zhang dissolved into golden light and vanished. A pensive look appeared over all of their faces, Hong Jun, however, still hadn't understood, and he was still musing over the whereabouts of the Karpiao. Yuan Kun rose, coming to stand in front of Hong Jun. He thought silently for a moment, before Mo Rijin suddenly asked, Kun God, are you planning to return to Chang'an? This was also something that the exorcism department had wanted to ask for a long time Hong Jun remembered that one of the tasks he had been given when he went down the mountain was to either expel or get rid of Xie Yu, allowing for Chongming to once again conquer Chang'an and control the human realm. Now, Xie Yu had fled, which meant that in the eyes of the Yao tribes, Chang'an was already a masterless land. Usually, Yuan Kun did not involve himself with the matters of the Yao tribes, but since he and Qing Xiong were on friendly terms, he evidently belonged to the Yejin Palace faction. Would Chongming return to Chang'an? And where was Qing Xiong now? Hung Jun immediately suggested, let's discuss that later B.A. Hung Jun thought to himself that last time, when he was leaving, Chongming had erupted with rage, but not long after this, he would have to find some time to take a trip back to the Taehang Mountains, so that he could properly sort out the matters in Chang'an. Instead of worrying about me, you'd best worry about yourself. Yuan Kun's tone seemed to be a little cold and reserved. Did you clearly hear the words from just now? Hung Jun, what words? Mo Rijin replied, I heard them clearly. With a wen, Yuan Kun vanished on the spot. That night, when everyone returned to the exorcism department, Imperial Consort Yang had already taken her leave. Li Jinglong was keeping the accounts in the study, but when everyone was about to go back to their rooms to sleep, Li Jinglong said, Come take your rewards before you go. The rewards this time around had far surpassed any previous times. Li Longji had rewarded them with a thousand liang of gold, and aside from splitting it up evenly amongst the members, Li Jinglong had also portioned out an extra portion for Lu Su. What are you giving me this much for? Lu Su asked. Your dowry, Li Jinglong replied, straight-faced. Everyone laughed at that. Lu Su was greatly embarrassed, and he said, give it all to Mo Rijin B.A. I don't need much money. Late into the night, Li Jinglong returned to the room to peel lychees for Hung Jun. When he heard Hung Jun detail what had happened, he thought for a moment, before saying, Zhao Zilong is still the next. It will come back, won't it? Hung Jun asked. Li Jinglong replied, that is certain. I, however, am thinking that the Kun God's objective tonight did not have anything to do with Zhao Zilong, but rather to tell us that there is still hope. Hung Jun asked, how much can we trust that monk's words? Li Jinglong. Hung Jun. Li Jinglong scooted in close to Hung Jun's ear, and he chuckled as he said, that wasn't a monk, wife. That was a Buddha. Hung Jun. Oh well, Li Jinglong said. Why think about all of these things all day long? You have your gegas to worry about these vexing matters. All you need to do is focus on eating. Hung Jun felt as if Li Jinglong's pampering was turning him dumber and dumber. Before, 
he would still think about a few things, but now, he didn't even use his brain much from morning to night. We'll set out to Hangzhou tomorrow for a vacation, Li Jinglong said. What you can't finish, eat on the way there. Come, sleep, let me feed you something different. And saying this, he hugged Hong Jun and pressed him down on the bed. In the early morning, in a little town in Chen Kang County, some ten plus villagers were gathered around the Karpiao's body, exclaiming in awe. Why does this fish even have feet? Is it a Yeogwai? It's been quite a few years since we've seen a Yeogwai. Should we send it to the county seat? Hey, my son found it, a villager said. If it's sold, the money goes to my family. Should we take it to the market and see, someone suggested. If they could truly sell it, they could take the money and feed everyone a good meal. Plus, they still had to invite a priest to the village to dispel the bad luck. The family that had gained the Karpiao assented readily. With that, someone got a fish hook and hung the Karpiao by its jaw, setting it out on the market to sell. The people passing by all gasped in shock, but when they asked after its price and learned that the starting price was 40 liang of silver, no one was willing to buy it. For one, it had two legs and two arms so it was kind of like human flesh, and the mere thought of boiling it to eat it made them shrink away. Two, it was already dead and no longer fresh. Its fish meat was also not tasty, and if they bought it and brought it home, the most they could do was air dry it. They couldn't use it as a decoration either, so what use was it? It just so happened that a traveling shoe merchant was passing through Chen Kang after coming from Kinchuan with his embroidered goods. When he saw this Karpiao, he was greatly shocked, and he immediately pulled out the money and bought it. Of course, after he bought it, he regretted it. Offering it up to the emperor wouldn't do, because he didn't know if he'd be able to keep it fresh until they entered Chang'an, if he boiled it to eat, who knows if that Yeogwai was poisoned. Plus, it had arms and legs, so no matter how he looked at it, he didn't want to eat it. That shoe merchant was, however, someone who had more than enough money to spend, so after he bought it, he ordered his men to set it aside, and to sprinkle some salt over it to first preserve it. He'd see if he could sell it off to some idiot in Chang'an. But in this day and age, Salt was also expensive. A hired hand of the caravan stuck a talisman to the Karpiao's head, rubbed some salt over its body, and tossed it into a corner of the caravan, not paying it any more attention. When the caravan left Chen Kang, thunder peeled overhead, and a heavy rain began to fall. The hired hands hurriedly draped the oilcloth over the wagons, and the rain came pouring down, Hualala washing over the Karpiao's entire body. When the rainwater came seeping in, the Karpiao's gill suddenly fluttered out and in, and it revived. Who? the Karpiao's eyes bulged roundly, and it flapped around and struggled for a bit, before it spread its arms out and, pressed against the boards of the cart, pushed itself up, its fish head turning this way and that as it studied its surroundings. Two golden pheasants from the plains were squeezed inside the cage, and they studied the Karpiao. The Karpiao murmured, where is this? I, it hurt so much. The Karpiao's entire body hurt greatly. Its charred scales began to fall off in large chunks. It slumped down against the cart, staring outside. We've arrived in Chen Kang, haven't we? One of the pheasants asked. The Karpiao was greatly startled, and it exclaimed, ah, Yeogwai. Aren't you also a Yeogwai? The other pheasant mocked him. Are you insane? When the Karpiao thought about it, that was true. It asked, how did, you two end up here? Are you blind, the first pheasant that had spoken said. Can't you see that we're locked up? Are you, both male, the Karpiao asked curiously, thinking about how usually, it was the males of the flying beasts that were more prettily feathered. Whether we're male or female, that's none of your business, the second pheasant said nastily. Are all you aquatic species so nosy? The Karpiao said, I'm in so much pain, the Karpiao's mouth hurt, its body hurt, and it was ravenously hungry to boot. 
the oil cloth had a few holes in it, and the rainwater came dripping down steadily. In a short amount of time, it had drenched the two pheasants and turned them into soup ready pheasants. Though it was summer, as it rained, it was so cold that the pheasants shivered a little. Not a single spot on their bodies was dry, so they had to huddle together for warmth. After the rain, Chang'an's air grew incredibly fresh. Li Jinglong led the members of the exorcism department out of the Hang Pass. Tu Raindic's wine shop had been temporarily left in the charge of her hired help, and she went along with A Tai out on their vacation. Everyone traveled along the paths amidst the green mountains to head towards Luyang. They stayed one night in the Luyang exorcism department, before they headed towards the Grand Canal. At this time, the Luo River Canal led directly towards Yangzhou, and it was midsummer, so there were endless large boats coming to and fro. With how seasick you get, we're still taking a boat. Hung Jun asked Li Jinglong. Chiu Yangxi smiled as he replied, that won't be an issue. The Luo River and the Grand Canal are not like the Yellow River, there aren't many winds or waves. Hey, we'll be borrowing Zenchi's spotlight today, only those who are officials can stay in this. It was true that the Jinghang waterway was much calmer than the Yellow River. According to what Chiu Yangxi had suggested, they rented out the middle deck of a large ship and six magnificent, beautiful upper-class cabins. As soon as the ship began to move, a breeze began to blow, and the sheer curtains fluttered in the breeze. The heat of summer retreated, and the scenery along the two banks was as beautiful as that of a painting. In a mere three days and nights, they would be able to arrive in Hangzhou. The last time Hong Jun took a boat, he had been staying in the central cabin under the deck. This was the first time he was taking a tower ship, and he was incredibly excited. At that, Li Jinglong kept him company as they wandered around. This huge ship was for the sake of ferrying around important officials, specially designated to bring officials of the third rank and above to Suhang, Luyang and the like. Li Jinglong had specially requested a written missive from the crown prince. He was a rising star under the crown prince's command, so naturally, the local officials had treated them carefully and respectfully along the way here. Along the canal, things went exactly as Chiu Yangxi had predicted. The waters were calm, and there was not much rocking. Plus, there were singers who were playing their pipas and singing, and a variety of carefully crafted pastries were offered on board as well. The group spent their days gathered in the spacious central hall. Those that read books read their books, those that enjoyed the scenery enjoyed the scenery. They did truly feel refreshed in mind and spirit. Hung Jun sat behind the railings, looking towards the green mountains on either shore. Li Jinglong sat to the side, behind a table, drinking tea. Mo Rijin and A Tai were comparing a sheaf of paper drawings and maps. They had done this without fail for several days now, and A Tai had even brought along a few ancient Persian texts, which he flipped through from time to time. What are you all looking at? Hung Jun could finally contain his curiosity no longer. Mo Rijin frowned. We're searching for the meaning of these symbols. Have you seen them before? Atai turned the piece of paper around to let Hung Jun have a look, but Hung Jun also shook his head. How about this one? Atai asked. Tu Raindic remarked, this doesn't really resemble the Uyghur script, nor does it look like the Tubo script. I don't even think these are characters. Atai said, they must be words. They can't be sigils. We've tried them already. Should we go once more? Tu Raindic put her hands on her hips. Atai immediately changed his tune. That's right, those aren't characters. It was only then that Tu Raindic settled. Hung Jun was torn between laughing and crying. End chapter.